Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, February 24th, we are studying Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Jesus speaks plainly for a second time concerning his upcoming suffering, death, and resurrection, and the twelve, once again, fail to understand what that means for Jesus and what it means for their own lives as his disciples. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor A.J. Espinoza. Pastor Espinoza serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Irvine, California. Pastor Espinoza, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Yeah, Pastor Apple, thanks for having me back. It's uh, It's been a little while, and looking forward to digging into this text. I, I love Mark. Awesome stuff. What do you love about Mark? Uh, I think that Mark gets underappreciated for just how much, uh, just, just really kind of how complex it is, almost I want to say like artistically. Mm. Um, you know, like all of these are, of course, the inspired Word of God, but they're 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 works of literature. You know, they're they're really well crafted stories, and Mark does a lot of that crafting stuff where things are put in parallel, and there's really interesting sequences and contrasts. And people kind of, I actually just I just heard this uh, just the other day that you know they refer to it as the abbreviated gospel, right? Like it's <laughs> kind of like stripped down, and it's just kind of boring and just the facts, or I I don't know what. Like it's like it's just kind of a skim outline with a. Uh, with, I don't know, too much stuff about demons, but, but I don't think it's like that at all. So I, I think you get little nuances that none of the other gospels have. I, I agree. And I think you're right that there is an impression out there that Mark is sort of, you know, Matthew's little brother, I think was another way that, that yeah. uh, someone else put it here as, as sort of the caricature of Mark. But the more that I, I've been reading it here on this study of Sharper Iron and just going through it and and following where he, he traces, you really do see how he has crafted the narrative and, and put it in the order and told it in the way that he intends to drive home certain points. So with that in mind, what is... What in terms of the way that Mark has laid out his narrative as a whole and in the immediate context, do we need to know as we prepare to look at these verses here in chapter nine? Well, I, I think that the, I don't know, especially in chapter nine, nine is such a a turning point, and, and I'm guessing that probably like the three guests before me and the three after me are all going to talk about the same thing at length. So. Uh, nothing like surprising there, I guess, but uh, it is this big turning point. And the way that Mark does it is it kind of, it kind of pivots around the idea of the son of man as, as he is related to Elijah. And that's, I think one of the things that is different from the other gospels is the way that Mark focuses on Elijah, unlike any other. Um, I don't think anyone else really, really kind of thinks of Elijah as so uh, central and, and uh, and primary here. And so you have this kind of just big surprise where the first half of the book, it's like, yeah, you know, the son of man coming with authority, going to judge fire, you know, and, and then you get this chapter and it's like, Hey guys, you know, son of man is going to die. Son of man is is going to get handed over to, you know, mere mortals who will not treat him very well. And, they're going to do the same things they did to Elijah. Look, just look at Elijah. Like so, so the the fact that John the Baptist gets executed just ends up being re- really, I think, in some ways, the big turning point of the whole gospel. Yeah, we talked about that back in chapter six. That as we see what happens to. John the Baptist, uh, we should understand him as the forerunner of the Christ in that moment as well. That in John's martyrdom and his execution, we should see John preparing the way for Jesus in his own execution. And I, I think, in, in a, and even more than that, than the and a greater surprise, I don't know if that's the right word, but is that there is one thing that Jesus precedes John in, and that would be the resurrection. But everything up to that, John is the forerunner, and then Jesus goes before him in in resurrection, which, you know, that's where Mark is, is going to lead us there at the end of the, the gospel. So any anything else in terms of, of context that we need to know about 
these particular verses, Jesus' second prediction of his passion and the the conversation he has with the disciples that follow? Well, I, I think that the the transfiguration again uh, about Elijah, right? Is what's kind of interesting. You mentioned, you know, the Lord preceding in terms of resurrection, but it's interesting because you see a resurrected Elijah seemingly um, at the beginning of chapter nine, um, and so. And so thinking about the resurrection and thinking about how the transfiguration has already spilled the beans or kind of given us a preview of that is, I think, central. You have, uh, I mean, it's in Mark that you have a, an Elijah saying connected to the transfiguration. Um, you don't do that in the other Gospels. The other Gospels, it's, you know, like, uh, listen to him and, and things like this. So uh, tying the, the, the Elijah stuff, really, and, and focusing on Elijah and the transfiguration so I think I think that's really big, and and then as you mentioned, um, this this commonly gets referred to as I guess the second uh, you know passion prediction, but I, I think that there's a question of is is that really what this is? Is Jesus repeating himself because his disciples are kind of slow, or is something else going on? And uh, I, I think that yeah, looking at that first uh, prediction, looking at the transfiguration. Um, looking at the disciples unsuccessfully casting out that unclean spirit, and then, you know, they're going to be arguing about who's the best. Yeah, that, that it's going to be really interesting how the last chapter really ties into this. Let's go ahead and take a look at the text then. We are in Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. That's our text for today, Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Pastor Espinoza, let's talk just briefly about the, the setting of these verses. At the beginning of this chapter, Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. He's come down the mountain where the other nine were gathered with a great crowd. We had the issue of, of not being able to cast out the demon by the nine. Jesus does. He's taken his disciples aside privately and taught them more about that. And now they're traveling in Galilee. He doesn't want anyone to know, which in Mark is not all that surprising, I suppose, because he's mm. told people to be quiet at several junctures in the gospel. Is there something particular going on that he doesn't want people to know at this moment? Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I mean, you, you see that in uh, like John also, right? Where like John uh, tells us that the Lord didn't, he wanted to go up to one of the festivals at, at Jerusalem at the temple, um, but he didn't want people to know, right? And even, uh, you know, is a little bit sneaky about it. So it's not a, and of course, even in all the gospels, you have, you know, these uh, injunctions for people not to, not to say anything. So it's, it's not like it's only in Mark, but yeah, the way that it comes out in Mark is pretty interesting. And like you said, like in the original language here, which the ESV uh, does get uh, somewhat here, uh, it just says, you know, he doesn't want anyone to know. Um, and, and I think that it, it's kind of obvious enough that it means that he doesn't want anyone to to know that he's there, that he's that he's going around. He doesn't want to be. I mean, I think that a better translation might be um, because you got to look at the the, the tense of uh, of no there. So it's not really no. It's more like you know anyone to find out. Mm. Um, so he doesn't he doesn't want people to find him. Um, and well, it, you have in verse thirty one the word for. And so verse 31 actually explains why he doesn't want people to know. Right. And and that's, I mean, I, I point that out and I appreciate the way you connect the two because I think that's exactly what's going on. 
you know, sometimes we've, we've said, well, in this case, Jesus is keeping things quiet for this reason or for that reason. It's not always the same. Here, it seems pretty obvious the reason he's not looking for a large crowd around him is so that he can teach his disciples. And and I think that's something that we're really going to see in this section, this transitional section that is chapter 9 and into chapter 10 as well. Jesus is really focused on teaching his disciples, as, as we're seeing here. Now, you said before we read the text that uh, this is commonly called the second passion prediction in the ESV. The heading above these verses is Jesus again foretells death and resurrection. Now, I, I certainly see the repetition that you have from the previous time Jesus spoke plainly. Verse 31 of chapter 8, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. So there's certainly things that are being repeated. And yet there's, I think, some new nuances, new points that get brought up here so that we shouldn't just say, oh, that's Jesus talking about his death and resurrection again. But let's actually pay attention to what he's saying with this particular text. So get us started into that, Pastor Espinoza. Yeah, so I think that the big thing um, that people miss, well, again, like it's, uh, you know, in, in English, we just have you know, I just say no, or I just say teaching, right? Um, but the Greek has these two different forms, and they each have their own little nuances here. And so the form there for, for teaching is pretty interesting. And I would say that actually the form is going to have more of a, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not going to bother naming, well, I mean, it's, it's a pluperfect progressive, right? <laughs> I think a it has big that word. Kind of nuance, which, yeah, I know, right? Which is to say, uh, for he had been teaching his disciples this. So actually, I don't think that the, the teaching per se is the reason why he didn't want people to know. Like, he's like, hey, I don't want anyone to, to bother us so that we can, you know, teach uh, and do some real, you know, learning here. I don't think it's that. I think it's actually the content of what he had been teaching is the reason. So I, I read it as, um, and, and so, uh, yeah, so, so he didn't want uh, anyone to find anyone to find out for he's been teaching his disciples and telling them that the Son of Man had been handed over or turned over into the hands of men. So that would be, as I would read it, the reason why he doesn't want anyone to find out about his location, because the Son of Man is uh, not safe. The Son of Man has been uh, turned over to the forces of darkness. So whereas he could go about freely before because God was uh, guarding him to a certain extent, that's not the case anymore. Something has changed. Mm. Take, take us into that a little bit more, Pastor. D- develop that idea. Something's changed. Well, so it's interesting that it says there, uh, you know, in our English standard version, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, like it's a future tense or something. But it is a it is a present actually in in the Greek, and when, when you have that in speech, you you have to in English translate it as the same tense that you were using for the speaking. So in, in Greek, you would say, you know, he told me that he, uh, like, for instance, like let's say I, I found someone on the street and uh, I I, just, I met them and they were trying to to sell me something. I, I'll tell you about this story later. And, I, and I'll say like, yeah, well, he, he told me he was uh, uh, with the uh, the clinical trials in Anaheim, right? I would say he told me he was, right? I would put both into past tense. But in Greek, you would say uh, he told me that he is. And so by putting it in the present tense, I, I think you guys translated as he uh, had been teaching and telling them that the Son of Man had been turned over into the hands of men. And so... If you're like, okay, so it, it's already happened. This is the state of things. Uh, the Son of Man, you know, was already not safe. Well, well, what changed? Well, I, I mean, I, I think it's the execution of Elijah. It, it's the execution of John the Baptist. That, I, I mean, at least, I don't know if you can narrow it down to exactly around that point. I mean, arguably, you could say it's the transfiguration, actually, um, that, that in the transfiguration, there's the kind of like one more moment of glory and then after that, it's like, okay, literally uh, all downhill from there. Oh, where's, the, where's my symbols? Um, but, but yeah, so I, I think that's the idea that there's this turning point in his ministry. And 
yeah, like he's uh, they're 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 as you were saying, you know, he, he's been prefigured by John the Baptist with its suffering, um, and it's clear now that the Son of Man is not going to get out of this easy either. Hmm. He and again, I I think that you know what he said back in in chapter eight, I think is still in view. He has told them that the Son of Man will suffer and be rejected and killed and three days rise. This matter of, of the delivering over, I do think adds that that wrinkle, among other things, that this is a word that's often used in contact with betrayal. This is the the same verb that will speak about Judas's action in betraying. And it's not it's not only used with Judas as the subject, but this this matter of right. the Son of Man, you know, that he's delivered into the hands, it invites, I guess, a, a bit of reflection as to some, some causes of it, you know, like on the one hand, Judas betrays Jesus. We know that, but on the other hand, you know, you also know that the, the chief priests, the scribes have a role in this, you know, that, that some, it, I guess in, in my mind, I'm, what I'm thinking about is like, who's, Who's in control of this situation? Who's directing the events? We've heard Jesus, you know, the word must was used previously that the Son of Man has to, it's necessary. Here, the Son of Man is being delivered into the hands of, of men. There's, there's an, there are other actors involved, I guess, is, is my point. And, and that's, you know, I, I'm yeah. just trying to, you know, the disciples hearing this, like, what, what is this, what does this mean that Jesus is going, he's, he's delivered into someone else is acting upon Jesus I, yeah. I think, you know, as the narrative continues, it will become plain that certainly Jesus directs events. And we've seen that. And the fact that he's, you know, yeah. there's some irony, I suppose, in the fact that he's saying this ahead of time, you know, that, that he's delivered. He knows it. He's still going to to Jerusalem. Anyway, I mean, that, that, that those words about yeah. the deliverance seem very important as you're bringing out as well. Yeah. OK. Yeah. No. That, that, yeah. Thanks for getting me back to that. So, yeah, I think the subject is God. Um, God, well, I mean, in terms of like uh, logic here, uh, that God is the one who's uh, turning him over to the hands of men. And, and I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, w- the, the big one, I think, is that you have this construction into hands of men. Um, there is there's no article. It's a it's a categorical um, compliment here. And, and so that's to say it's like turned over into human power or turned over to human jurisdiction or something like turned over to, to human discretion. Uh, and, and so to, to, and, and the word that really ends up getting focused is, is human or men. So I, I think because of that, uh, we wouldn't hear say that it's betrayal, like Judas betraying him um, and handing him over to someone else because, uh, well, Judas is human. <laughs> so it doesn't really make uh, we, we can't say that, you know, Judas, like, turned him over to the hands of humanity. It, it would, he would already have to be in the hands of humanity for that to happen. Uh, this, this is God. This is God giving his son up. This is, this is Abraham offering up his son Isaac here. This is, uh, this, this is, uh, this is uh, related to the word that's used in the Septuagint translation of Job, where God says to Satan, uh, you know, here, here's everything as, as much as he has, I give it into your hand. Uh, they're speaking to, of course, Satan. So I, I think that's the idea here that, that God has turned his son over here. Uh, Paul speaks this way in Romans chapter eight, he uses the same verb about God giving his son up. It doesn't, it doesn't say, you know, the, the verb is the same in the Greek, the way it, the way it reads in the ESV, at least in eight Romans eight thirty two. he who did not spare his own, but own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also yeah. with, a, yeah. you know, graciously give us all things that this is the, the father's love. I mean, it, John three sixteen. God loved the world in this way that he gave his only son. I'm not sure if it's the exact same verb in John 3:16, but it's the same really same theology, related. right? That that this yeah. is God doing this for the sake of of salvation for sinners. So, again, that that's that's one of the new nuances here in this, you know, what's sometimes called the second passion prediction. Now, what what else do we see in in what Jesus is teaching his disciples here in verse 31? Well, uh so this this idea of uh, okay, the, the God has you know turned the the sun over, uh, you know that we are on the the back half of of this ministry now, 
um, if you if you kind of take it this way, which I, I think is the way that's naturally coming from the language, um, it's it's pretty fascinating because you, you go and it says, and they will kill him, and when he is killed, after three days he will rise. Like I was really reflecting on this. I don't think anyone talks about this, but um, that's a really repetitive sentence if you take it as uh, the Son of Man will be delivered, they will kill him, and when they kill him, then he will, it, it's sort of like, why would you repeat when they kill him if it's just a sequence of, you know, A, B, uh, C, because it's like A, B, B, C, right? Like, it's like, uh, you know, they will betray him, they will kill him, and when they kill him, they he will rise. Um, but, but as I was saying, I don't think that's the way you take it. I think that the language is actually telling us the Son of Man, you know, has been turned over to human authority, has been given over to human jurisdiction, and he's going to get killed, uh, you know, and, and, they're, and they're going to kill him. And, and then there's a shift to, okay, let's talk concrete, though. When they do kill him, it, it's fascinating because that, that phrase, you know, and when he is killed, that's just or the when he is killed part, that's just one word in Greek. <laughs> um, it's like when he is killed, it, it, I think it is a little bit slightly emphatic. It's a little bit odd if you look at it in Greek. When he is killed, after three days he will rise. So uh, it, it is really, I think, fascinating how Jesus goes and takes this kind of general statement about this is what's going on right now, and this is this is kind of the thing, and, and this is kind of the pattern, you know, before you know, uh, earlier in this chapter, it was like, you know, Elijah comes first to restore all things, you know, kind of talking in this kind of broad, uh, you know, no mixed sense of this is, this is how things are. But now he gets really specific and puts a timetable on this thing, <laughs> which is, I mean, it's fascinating. It's the reason why there's a, a possibly significant variant here. Uh, at least a number of people, interpreters, early interpreters thought it was important. Um, but yeah, I mean, the fact that Jesus is not just speaking generalities, but says, uh, no, this is, it's going to happen like this in, in concrete terms and days. Right. Yeah. The, the three, after three days, he will rise. Jesus spoke similarly previously in chapter eight, again, after three days rise again, that is a very concrete promise that you know three days that's a pretty significant number in the in the scriptures this this third day event uh t tell us more about that pastor espinoza well um i think that one of the things that's uh as i mentioned that there's that there's a variant here um and, and, it's, and it's interesting because earlier in chapter eight we, we don't have um a variant but but here there is um like I mean, so so in, here's the difference, right? So in, in chapter eight, um, the Son of Man, you know, must, must suffer many things and be rejected, uh, you know, and then ends up with killed and after three days rise again. But so there, because you, you do have kind of like rejected by the elders and the chief priests, right? I think that that's maybe why early scribes were okay with it, because if the Lord's rejected, right, like, uh, you know, Thursday night, then... Well, okay, like that that kind of makes sense. Like Thursday night into Friday night into Saturday night, and then it happens on Sunday. Okay, yeah, that's three days. Uh, but here in chapter nine, um, you you have you know, and when he is killed, right? Um, after three days, he will rise. And, and I think that's where early interpreters say, "Oh, hang on a second, that doesn't seem right." And so you have uh, this variant that's uh, put in a number of uh, kind of prominent texts. That, that takes it instead to, on the third day, he will rise, which uh, is probably what we're more familiar with, right? Like, it's like in our creed. So there's this variant of, is it after three days, or is it uh, on the third day? And historically, this has, like, been all kinds of, uh, I mean, I mean controversy, and, and, and maybe someone's saying, like, oh, what, what's it matter, like, if he was killed on this day or that day? When you're talking about the death of the Son of God and, like, what that means for the universe— like the timing of the events is really significant because if he dies on one day, you know, it means that this is what his death means for humanity. If he dies on another day, it, it says, well, this is what his death means for all of humanity. So it, it ends up mattering a lot. 
So, I mean, what what do we do with that, Pastor? I mean, how do how do we how do we take that that difficulty? How do we how do we understand those those issues? Yeah. Well, uh, so I, I think it, I think it's this that uh, there's two different. And I think this is actually ultimately why you have the variant. Um, there's two different ways of thinking about the verb kill. Um, one is to kind of focus in on the person dying, right? Um, the other side of it is to focus in on the perpetrator, um, you know, committing acts of aggression and purposefully intending uh, death, right? And so that's the thing. If you focus in on uh, the Lord's death, see, it's, it's fascinating. It doesn't say, like, and when he dies, and when he dies after three days, he will rise, right? Because, you know, if he doesn't die till, you know, um, Friday, you know, afternoon, um, it, it's like, well, hang on a second. How do we get three days, you know, when we, when we get to, uh, when we get to, to Sunday? So that's, I think, why some people are wanting to change it to on the third day. Because on the third day was just a Greek idiom, uh, not even Greek idiom. Uh, it was used in uh, Hebrew also. Uh, on the third day just means the day after tomorrow or the, the day after, like, like two days afterwards, right? So if you change it to that, which is the variant, it makes good sense. But you don't have to do that. If you think of killing as perpetrating these acts, well, I mean, they, they put them up, they were putting them up on the cross Friday morning, right? So if you, if you think about that, if you think about they were, you know, um, shouting crucify him, right, you know, early on on Friday, well, now all of a sudden this can make some sense, right? Because uh, you, you, you think about the Jewish reckoning, uh, the new day begins at, at sunset. So you got most of Friday, they're killing him, right? Um, and then you got Saturday at nightfall on Friday. Um, and then, you know, nightfall on Saturday, that's, that's a third day beginning. Um, and then it's the resurrection's roughly around sunrise on Sunday. So that's, a, that's two and a half days. Um, and that's fine. Uh, two and a half days, no, <laughs> no one says it in this time. After two and a half days, that's after 2.5, no, <laughs> you'd say three days. So um, I think I think that's actually... The, the way that you solve it, which is interesting because the focus then, again, is on human agency, right? Mm -hmm. It's being given over to human agency. Uh, the Son of Man's been given over to the whims of humanity, and it's what they're doing, and it's what they're planning, and the focus is on them acting as killers here, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, so this is just, this is just fascinating. Uh, it's like just a different way of thinking about it that, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, it's, uh, it's not the way that we always do. Sure, and and it's no wonder then that the disciples didn't understand the saying. And we'll we'll pick up more of that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO, looking at Mark chapter nine with Pastor AJ Espinoza. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, February 24th. We're looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. We have Pastor A.J. Espinoza with us. He serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Irvine, California. Pastor Espinoza, prior to the break, we were looking at Jesus teaching his disciples concerning his deliverance into the power of men who kill him. When he's killed, he will rise they don't understand. The disciples don't understand. This isn't something that's new. We've we've seen their lack of understanding throughout the Gospel of Mark, and very recently it's been highlighted on numerous occasions. The thing that stands out to me in verse 32 is that at this point they're afraid to ask him. They've not been afraid to ask Jesus questions previously. Here they are. And, and the reason that really stands out to me is only a few verses earlier, Jesus encouraged his disciples toward prayer, particularly in the casting out of the demon. You know, they asked him, why, why couldn't we cast out that demon? And Jesus says, this can't, this kind can't be driven out by anything but prayer. Here he's taught them. And 
they don't understand and they even fail to pray. They fail to ask him again. It, we see the, we see the, the failure of the disciples on display. They don't understand. Take, take us into that verse 32. Yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's again, interesting the the way the, you know, the tense is it, it kind of, you know, I think you might, it might be a good way to, to keep reading it as that kind of like, Perfect progressive, where it's like you know they or you know, they had been, uh, or or maybe even like a, just an actual kind of like blue perfect, like they had been afraid or like they they had not understood the saying. Um, but the, the, I think the big thing is at the end, the the word ask is actually the the word that's narrowly focused there. So it stands out um, Greek word order in a typical sentence. Well, uh, we'll, we'll say ask him like we do in English, but in Greek here in this sentence, it says him ask. Um, so I think if you were, if you're reading it out loud, it's like, uh, but they didn't understand the saying and uh, they were afraid to ask. Right. right? Like, so when you, when you read it like that, um, I, I think <laughs> it, it invites a few different things. It's like, are they scared to find out? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, well, I don't even want to know, man. Like, you know, like they're, they're afraid to ask, um, you know, is it that, you know, they're, they're embarrassed. Uh, I mean, that could be, uh, I mean, like in the very next few verses, there's perhaps an implication that they're embarrassed to tell uh, the Lord Jesus what they had been talking about. So yeah, it, it's interesting. It, um, the the fact that they're 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 afraid to that they're afraid to ask at this point um you know it, it's it's uh i think it invites a couple different possibilities hmm. so uh, their their lack of understanding you know that it's it's said right there very plainly by mark and as the text continues it seems their actions and their further conversation also reveal a lack of understanding in verse 33, they, they come to Capernaum, which is, is Jesus home base during his Galilean ministry? This is familiar territory for Jesus. He goes into the house and, and he asks them, what were you discussing on the way? And, and they start to keep silent here because, and as you said, it seems like there's some embarrassment. It, maybe just, uh, let's start by the, the, the topic of their conversation. They'd been arguing about who was the greatest man, you know, Jesus has just been teaching about his deliverance into the power of men, his being killed, his being raised, and they're worried about who's the greatest. Seems like just a, like totally on different levels here. Jesus is, is teaching one thing and the disciples are thinking about something different. Tell us a little bit about what's maybe going on with the disciples here. Yeah. You know, I, it's interesting. And, uh, I, you know, I have a hermeneutic of sympathy when it comes to the disciples or pretty much actually any biblical character. Um, I, I think that there's some good reasons, perhaps, why they might be arguing about this. Um, you know, let, let's remember when Jesus, our Lord, took, uh, you know, some of his disciples up onto the Mount Transfiguration. He only took that inner circle, right? Peter, James and John. Um you know, so that's that's one thing that's uh, well. I mean, it's interesting too. Actually, uh, even the way that Jesus sets that up, and at the very this is uh, chapter nine, verse one. There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power, right? So there, there's, there's already kind of this like, well, hang on a second, like who, <laughs> uh, who who gets to see this, right? Um, and then of course when they when they fail to cast out uh, the demon, right? It, it's interesting because it doesn't, I don't think it actually says that like all nine, like, you know, went down in a line and it was like, you know, like we, we couldn't, you know, like you know, not, not a single one of us, like not, not Peter, not, not, not James, not John, not, you know, Bartholomew, like, like, like it doesn't, it doesn't say that. So um, it would be kind of interesting if, I don't know, like a, a certain few of them tried and then failed. Mm. Right. And so, so the, I think that there's some some things there that could possibly just invite this. Also, um, the other thing you mentioned, Capernaum. I think it's fascinating because in Mark, you have Mark just refer to the boat and the house, and uh, I think that's I think it's it's uh, basically kind of shorthand 
for referring to Peter's house and Peter's boat. Right. Um, and these things just happen and are, are used again and again so often. It's just kind of like if you were there following around Jesus, you would have just said, hey, guys, let's go back to the house. Right. Because it was just kind of like the, the base of operations. I, I think it's like fascinating because like, little details like that, I think, are evidence of the story being told from the perspective of someone who was part of this, um, which is a little detail that I think would not be easily faked. Um, just like, you know, just because uh, no one uh, writing at that time had a degree in linguistics. So, I mean, just, you know, that's an interesting little thing there. But so, so, so they're, they're, they're going to Peter's house, right? And, and, you know, Peter's boat. And so I think there's like a lot of things going on here that's like, it's a live question. Like, hang on a second. Which of the disciples is in charge is like the, uh, the one who gets to make the decisions, you know, and, and again, going back to John, the Gospel of John, um, you know, the disciples were, had different opinions about whether they should follow Jesus to Jerusalem to go to die, right? And so it's sort of like, well, well, hang on a second, guys. Like, who gets, who gets the final say-so here? Who's actually in charge? Um, so I think when you look at it like that, um, because the word uh, mesone there, greater, is uh, basically equivalent to uh, who's, who's eldest or who has the, the greatest authority, like who's in charge, and that's what Jesus himself does with it, right? Where he goes and he says, uh, you know, if anyone would be first, right? Like, so I don't think that's Jesus changing the subject. I think that's, uh, that, that's him following up on this. I, I think it's, it's uh, actually a legitimate question. The disciples are trying to figure out who among them is second in command. Well, and, and I think, you know, that, as you said, given the context, it's not entirely out of place. And, and I, I agree, we shouldn't always just automatically assume the exact worst about the disciples and try to you know put it put yourself in their shoes the the thing that that i'm reminded of too this isn't the only time in the gospels where the disciples have a conversation like this another time if in the gospel of luke this conversation about who's the greatest also occurs on monday thursday right after jesus has talked about his betrayal and, and they're more specifically about his actual betrayal on that on that night. And they're they're talking again right after it about who's the greatest, which, again, you know, I mean, not not to say that it was you know, like, oh, this is a good idea, guys, but to, to understand where they're coming from that. OK, well, if, if Jesus is gone, if he is going to be killed, who's who's next, who's yeah. who's important, right. you know, who takes charge, you know, at least from a human perspective, it. It makes sense, and and from a, a human perspective, like we're always doing this. We're we're always ranking ourselves. Trying oh yeah. To, I mean, this isn't again not to not to excuse a, a, a sinful desire for greatness, but this is something that is just a natural conversation that and a, a natural thing that's always happening in our own minds. Yeah, well, you know, I think that's uh, I think that's true. Like, I mean, and, and in in a church, even right. I mean, like this is. I mean, we're asking these questions. It's like, you know, we're, we're talking about families. It's like, well, hang on, who's who's in charge, right? And people are saying, like, well, the man's the head of the household. And someone else is like, well, no, it's uh, it's consensus and mutual submission and and, and things like this. Um, or like, you know, in, in the church, like, you know, what kind of structure should we have? And, you know, in our own LCMS, we, we made a move away from, um, you know, like having like, you know, bishops um, per se. And it was kind of more of a, uh, I don't know why, more distribute uh, a greater distribution of, of power, right? Um, and, and so it, it's it's a it's a live question, and it's a question you kind of just have to deal with, right? Like at the end of the day, it's like you can either turn left or turn right, but <laughs> you know, if one person says what, if one person says the other, like we're gonna we're gonna go with one guy and not the other guy, right? So it's like you you have to like it like it's it, there could be like a, a sinful desire for greatness, but um, you know, the word in Greek, um, you know, I, I feel like usually focuses in more on this kind of just sense of like, you know, just like, hang on a second, who's in command, right? Like, which is, you know, like if you're like, a, you know, in, in the military or something like that, or in a, 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 a crazy situation, who's in command, right? Like, like, what, what, like, who's next on the chain of command? That's a legitimate, like, like you were saying, question, especially when you're considering that the Lord might uh, die pretty soon, right? So um, I think the other side of it, too, is that, you know, they're afraid to ask him. Like, I wonder how much of it's like they're, they're thinking like, well, well, just just I mean, you know, again, putting yourself 
yourselves, uh, you know, in, in their shoes, like Jesus is cryptic and he tells riddles. <laughs> you ask him a question and he answers back with a question, you know? And so it's like, you're, you're almost just afraid to ask him because you're just like, Oh man, like <laughs> what's he going to like hit me upside the head with, you know, like what, what kind of next level question is he going to pull on me? If I ask him this question, you know, like, and, and, and so it's a, there, there's a certain amount of like, we need some guy here to like, tell us, tell the rest of us what he needs, <laughs> like to like inter- interpret Jesus for us and to, like spell it out. Cause Jesus is like, you know, he's, he's not just, you know, here, here's the, the, the simple, uh, you know, answering the question the way that you want me to answer it. I'm going to answer it the way that I want to answer it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is just something kind of humanly inevitable about it. And we struggle with that when we talk about families and pastors and hmm. men and women and uh, like all the rest of it. Like we have to sort that out because we hear the voice of Jesus, of course, but we hear the voice of Jesus through people. So with that, then take us into to what Jesus actually says. You know, they they don't own up to the conversation. They don't they don't say anything. They're silent again because they've been talking about the greatest. Jesus sits them down. He calls the twelve to him, and he he begins by saying this: If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Before we get to the object lesson that Jesus gives, just take us into those words of Jesus. They're very familiar to us, I think, but there's, there's so much there to explore. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty interesting. Like I said, like he does like shift the word, right? So he doesn't, he doesn't say like, you know, if anyone would be greatest, he must be least. Um, he, 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 which is helpful, I think, because it just, it points us to, okay, like we should be interpreting this then as like, where do greater and, and first overlap, right? And it's, it's with, like we were saying, like authority here. Um, so, you know, he, he helpfully kind of gets to the heart of what they're getting at. Like, okay, like, you know, who, who, who wants to be in, in command? Who wants to be in charge? Right. Um, you know, the idea of first, especially, um, is so intimately connected with the idea of uh, in charge authority, right? Like the, the the word, in fact, in Greek and Hebrew for for leaders, right, is just uh, basically like first ones. <laughs> you know, like in, in, in Greek, it's like literally it's related to the word for like in the beginning. And again, John, right? So uh, yeah, whoever wants to be the leader, <laughs> right, wants to be leader, basically. Um, will and and uh, this, this is it's fascinating here, like uh, will. Uh, of all, you know, be last and of all be servant. And, and so I, I think that there's a, like a little bit of a, like, like a, a weight on those, right? Like where, where it's like, you know, this unexpected, like, whoa, that's how you have to be the leader, which I think um, just, just fits in so well with what he said about the son of man and John the Baptist, Elijah, right? Like, Hey, like, if this is what happened to Elijah, then you, you think it's going to go any better for the Son of Man? And if that's what happened to the Son of Man, you think it's going to go any better for the, the leaders of the church? Uh, no. I mean, like, this is, and, and, uh, and this is what the, the Lord says in other places, too, um, in, in the Gospels, right? Like, it's the same kind of basic idea. If this is how the world treated me, how do you think the world's going to treat you guys? Right. So yeah, if, if anyone must first, he must be last of all, servant of all. And then Jesus uses an object lesson. He takes a child and puts him in the midst of them, takes the child in his arms. Just before we get to what Jesus says, that action of Jesus, taking a child, putting the child in the midst of the disciples, even taking that child in his arms, what is Jesus communicating by that action? Yeah, good, good question. Like, I think that one of the things here, uh, the word is um, pedion, uh, which is like the same word related to what we get, like pedagogy, right? Children. Um, so it, it's a, it's a, it's a broad word. It could refer to, I mean, it could refer to like a servant who's not even like that, like childlike. Um, it could. Uh, refer to like a, an older child who's like, say like seven years old, it could refer to, uh, uh, I mean like an infant. And in fact, in the gospels, it's even used, um, this way to refer to like the G like, you know, the infant Jesus. Right. Um, I think the significance of, uh, taking him into his arms 
is that it tells us what kind of child this is, right? Like I remember, like uh, it's I think it's I think it's I think it's also in the Gospel of Mark where um, it says like you know he raises the little girl from the dead and it says like and she got up and began to walk and then he says well you know she had yeah or she was twelve years old, right? And he's saying that because like uh, he doesn't want us to think like he he raised a a one year old from the dead and the one year old also miraculously learned how to walk at the same time. <laughs> right? Like it's, it's like, no, he, she already knew how to walk guys. So I, I think by, by saying that he takes the child up into his arms, it's actually telling us what kind of child this is. This is a, a little one, you know, this, 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 this is the, the little kind that just kind of wanders around <laughs> if you don't grab them, you know? So I think that this is uh, basically either an infant or a toddler uh, basically, which is uh, pretty striking because it's uh, it's humanly speaking the bottom of the totem pole, right? Like you know, I've got I've got three children. Uh, you know, one who's uh, a bun in the oven, uh, one who's uh, four years old, and one who's two years old. And and that two year old is uh, is a little bit used to being at the bottom of the totem pole because she knows that she basically has to listen to her older sister. <laughs> her older <laughs> sister, I know, pray, pray, praise God, you know, four year four years old is is for a four-year-old, you know, very responsible and very mature. And, and she looks after her little sister and is constantly teaching her things like, like relaying the lessons that we've taught her uh, to her little sister. Um, and, and so that, that little kid is just on the bottom, right? Like have to listen to everybody else. There is no one that Natalie gets to boss around. <laughs> like it, She's at the bottom. So I think that's the significance here, and, and uh, we got to be careful, right? Because we just have such a uh, a reflex to just kind of sentimentalize anything with children. And it's right. like, oh, you know, whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of heaven, like a little child, you know, like a child, like they, you know, children are so great. And, and I think that that's not that's not the point. Like it's it's you you, you got to be the bottom, right? I mean, I mean that the slaves. Think about that. The slaves in this world boss the children around, hmm. right? So he just said, like, you know, lower than the slaves, in fact. Like, you, there, is, there is no one who you aren't, um, like, under, basically. Hmm. Right. So, so this isn't Jesus providing a, a warm, fuzzy picture, but rather this would have been quite shocking for the disciples to see Jesus use a child as an object lesson and sort of like, whoa, hold on. This is, this is the picture that you're giving us by putting a, a child into our midst, taking that, that small child into his arms. And then he says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. How does, how does this relate to what Jesus has been saying? What is Jesus teaching his disciples with this last verse of our text? Yeah, well, and this is a point that um, you know, that that uh, Jim Veltz brings out in his, his commentary, and uh, you know, and in, in, in fact, the class I took with him on the Gospel of Mark. But you know, here here is then where he makes the move because um, that that word there for like you know such a, a child here, um, it's not like you know, um, like like this child or like these children, uh, but you know, th- basically like someone who is this kind of child, right? So this is where he's like talking about his disciples, right? Whoever deceives, whoever receives uh, a disciple who has so humbled himself, right? It, like who has humbled himself thus in, in this sort of way, right? Receives me. So, I mean, I, I think there, there he's kind of completing it, right? Like if you want to be a leader, you've got to be everybody else's slave, so if you want to be first, you got to be at the bottom of the totem pole. But if you're at the bottom of the totem pole, then you are the representative of Christ himself, right? Which, which you think about it, that goes back to what they're originally getting at. Who's second in command? Who represents the will of Jesus? Who can, who can speak and represent and stand for Jesus, right? So that when you listen to them, you're listening to Jesus. Or when you receive them or welcome them, right? You're, you're welcoming Jesus, right? Like it's, uh, this welcoming language is a little bit of a, again, of an authority thing, right? Like you, you send someone who represents you, like your proxy, your, your viceroy, right? So he's, com- he's completed it, right? Like whoever wants to be first has got to be at the very bottom, but whoever's at the very bottom like this, well, that's, that's me. Like you represent them, the very top, the Christ himself. 
Okay, so okay, keep, keep going, keep going. Well, and then, and then, and then at the end, like, receives not me, but him who sent me. So he does even further, right? Ultimately, God himself, mm-hmm. right? So, so he goes and just, you know, from the very bottom to the very top. Mm, right, which you know, that's turning turning things over would would then the would the converse of this be true that is, so to receive a child in Jesus' name receives Jesus, and then to receive the Father who sent to not receive a child would to not receive Jesus and not receive the Father. Um, I don't think that the text is, or I don't think Jesus, our Lord here, is is um, is is going that way. Like I, I think I think it's more of like the idea of. Uh, like, like the, I think the idea is kind of like, like who, who is this person, right? Um, in, in the, in the positive, who's being received, right? Because like that's kind of like the, the, the logic question of all of this, like, like how, how do you be first? And so I, I, I think that the picture has to keep that person, right? So if you, if you look at the opposite, the corollary, like whoever, like you know, doesn't receive him, um, now that person's like kind of not in the, in the picture anymore. I mean, like I think that you get that idea, fair enough, um, like in the. Uh, the parable of like the sheep and the goats. Right. Right. Um, and I think that that's, that's kind of, um, that, that's like kind of what's going on. I, I think in that context, it's like, if you kind of basically, you like mistreat, um, you know, like these like, uh, humble brothers in the faith, you mistreat Christ himself. Right. So I, I think the, the idea is there, um, elsewhere, but, yeah, yeah, I think I think it's it's just fascinating here how like he just really is getting to the uh, to the authority stuff, and it's like he won't he won't he won't budge. It's like th- this is how it is, guys. Like the Son of Man is is going to get killed. Um, the Son of Man is not safe anymore. The Son of Man has been turned over right to human authority. Like in some, like like this reminds me about the Psalm, right? Um, you know that 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 God would like put everything, all his enemies, under his feet make them his footstool, right? Well, in this situation, God has put his son underneath his enemies, right? Like, th- th- this is the reversal. He's, he's put Christ underneath the enemies, right? He, he, is in, he lives in danger now, um, so that those who, who make themselves last in that way in him will rise with him uh, in the resurrection, but also will rise in authority. Um, and like it says uh, in Ephesians, right? Um, will be seated in the heavenly places with him and judge the earth. Pastor Smoza, with just about a minute left, any concluding thoughts? Wrap things up for us this morning on Mark chapter nine. Well, I, I think that again, like this, just the, the human element of how do you sort this stuff out, right? Like it's challenging because, uh, humanly speaking, it, there has to be someone or something in charge. Well, I mean, like ultimately, someone, right, uh, of any group of people. Like, you can't even say, like, oh, well, it's the Constitution. Well, because guess what? The person who's in charge then is whoever interprets the Constitution, <laughs> right? So it's like there's always going to be somebody in charge. There's no getting around this, right? So on one level, it's like, yeah, like, power is just, it's how it is. Um, on the other level, it, it's, there, there's this, this, uh, this deeper truth about what power in the kingdom of God and what that looks like. So, yeah, there's, there's leaders in the church, but... To, to be a leader, it, it means putting putting yourself last, which is a great mystery, and it's super challenging, right? Because on the one hand, like, you still have to be a leader and make hard decisions and not just uh, take a poll. If you're a pastor, please, like, don't just take a poll every time you'll be, if you're thinking about something. Um, and yet, on the other hand, you are the slave at the bottom of the totem pole of everyone else in the congregation. Um, and every Christian should be striving to live that way. So it's it's a it's a great paradox, and I think the most helpful thing is just to keep looking at Jesus, because he's the only one who uh, really modeled it, who would really pull this off. Mm. Come, come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Excellent words during this Lenten season. Pastor A.J. Espinoza serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Irvine, California, helping us this morning with Mark chapter nine, verses thirty through thirty-seven. Pastor Espinoza, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks for having me, brother. Good talking to you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Mark chapter 9 or any of the gospel according to St. Mark, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.